We've got Zihan Wang, who is the original co-founder and CTO of Magic Pony, which is now part of Twitter. Uh, and they work on machine learning for um, video and images, mostly on super resolution. And um, before that, he held a PhD from Imperial and was at Entrepreneur First. So with that, welcome Zihan. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Good morning, everyone. So um, I'm basically going to talk to you about sort of one of the core pieces that we've been doing ever since we started Magic Pony. Um, but before I jump into that, just briefly talk to you about what Magic Pony do at Twitter. We're effectively the embedded ML team within sort of the image and video uh, organization on Twitter. So we, you can think of us sort of as the computer vision arm, but a lot of our work is also focused around video performance, but through applications of machine learning. Um, and super resolution and compression is basically one of the key components. Um, so how do we get onto this? So I guess um, kind of rolling back to sort of the start of Magic Pony, I had this weird interest in super resolution. It was this thing that was discussed in research and as sort of a topic, which is like, yeah, it's got all these great applications. And I was like, but why don't people use it for anything? And it's like, I've never seen us used in the wild. Um, and that's kind of when I sort of, you know, really charged at it and thought about where else can we apply it. Um, and one of the other things kind of that was going on at the time, and this was some uh, forecast released by Cisco, looking at the breakdown in, in data on the internet. Uh, and you, the bar in red is video traffic. So video by far is becoming the most, um, you know, taking up most of the bandwidth on the internet. We know like Netflix itself probably um, is about 40% of all internet traffic in the US alone. And then by 2020, we're looking for this uh, percentage to be 80% just dominated by video traffic. Um, and we know this is going to be a problem, for, particularly for developing countries which have limited bandwidth. At the same time, as people have you know, higher demands for higher quality video, this is going to put a lot of strain on existing networks and, and the capacity that exists. So um, you might be thinking, how does super re resolution relate to video compression? Uh, and one of the kind of interesting things about sort of how compression works is that it, it's really down to a few factors of the video or images itself. Um, one of them sort of quantization, how much data do you throw away? Uh, and then sort of the next two factors, the height and width, essentially the resolution of video plays a part in how much data you're transmitting. And then there's other components like the frame rate and sort of the motion rate of how fast um, characters are moving on screen, for example. So clearly, if we can reduce the frame and uh, height and width of the video, we can reduce the bit rate. And in a sense, we have achieved compression without actually touching the codec. Uh, and that's kind of the sort of founding idea of like, why do we want to use super resolution to, to, for this sort of usage? Um, and that's all assuming that the super resolution algorithm can actually restore the, the resolution to high enough um, fidelity in the first place. So obviously, there's a. <laughs> A lot of uh, real world uh, problems that prevent it from being used in the wild, or sort of to date, why it hasn't actually been used, even though I'm probably not the first person to think of this uh, approach. Um, so, for one, this is a kind of a hard, ill posed problem. Uh, there's you know, multitudes of different solutions when you're going from like a low dimensional space into a high dimensional space, plus, you know, how well it generalizes different content and runtime complexities. Um, sort of in the past, people have like come up with a whole variety of different methods and approaches, ranging from like you know simple statistic-based methods to looking at you know, patch-based, sparse coding, dictionary learning, random forest, and then more recently, like deep learning has obviously come come into this as well. And that's kind of where we start the story at is from that deep learning side. Um, so typically in sort of uh, this problem, you kind of start with, with a high resolution image and you look at, okay, what I'm doing to reduce the resolution. And then you're effectively trying to figure out some way to restore that resolution from the low resolution image. Um, and people generally just kind of think of this as sort of like data interpolation. So assume you've got two pixels with two different values, maybe you can just interpolate between them and then you get you know, some more values and then you can use that as a higher resolution. Um, but obviously, it's not quite as simple as that, given that the content itself, it doesn't exactly perform smoothly throughout for different content. Um, and you have lots of complexities in sort of what you're trying to actually capture uh, and the dimensionality of the problem itself. So 
people have been looking at applying machine learning to this. So you learn some function which minimizes um, the error of like what you're predicting to be the high res compared to the actual high res. And you kind of use this in a training loop to try and figure out some function which can do this super resolution uh, work. Um, and then sort of the first sort of deep learning approach was this uh, method by uh, Dong, um, which kind of really opened the doors for like deep learning as sort of the basis for people now sort of experimenting with super resolution. Um, but it was kind of almost like a very naive out of the box method. Let's stick a CNN in the middle and see how well it performs. Uh, and then actually it performed pretty well. Um, so like pretty much everything in deep learning, the first time you try it, it's like, hey, it works better than all the previous methods that came before it. <laughs> uh, so the previous method before that was this approach using sparse coding and dictionary learning. And then all of a sudden you see there's a big jump in like uh, PSNR, which is how we measure the quality or one of the ways we measure quality. Um, but one of the problems with, with what was used here um, which we kind of addressed in a, in a paper that we published last year was really um, it was because it was such a naive method. You, the CNN itself has no idea of how to resize or resample the the data into high resolution. You know, people have come up with like um, pooling layers and and dropout and so on, which basically reduce the dimensionality of the of the data. Um, and one of the sort of hacks that they had to do is basically they apply bicubic upsampling to put the low resolution image in the same dimensionality as the high resolution image in the first place, which means you're not actually getting anything new with that sort of initial filter, but it increases the amount of computational complexity you have to do with a neural network. Um, so, you know, one of the papers that we came up with, which kind of addressed this was really coming up with this particular layer, which we call a subpixel convolution layer, which does this upscaling function itself. And it learns how to do the upscaling rather than um, being construed by the bicubic upsampling. Um, and a kind of, as a result, we kind of got much, much better sort of an order of magnitude faster in terms of runtime performance. But at the same time, because we're learning an upsampling function, um, we improve in the quality of the results as well. So this kind of was our proud achievement um, last year, uh, when we, which we presented at CVPR and showing that, you know, this is doing, you know, really good stuff and we managed to get it running uh, real time on mobile devices, uh, which I'm not going to demo here because it's kind of old news. I kind of want to move on to some new stuff. Um, but afterwards, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, feel free and I can show you. Um, so one of the things that we kind of talked about with this approach is that we're still looking at from the context of like interpolation. And um, really, the problem here is that we can't restore fine textures, which was never there in the first place in the low resolution uh, space. Um, and then, you know, if we look at sort of smooth textures like this, sort of in, in low resolution, if we just apply bicubic cup sampling to make it the same size as a high res, you see there's a massive difference in sort of the level of fidelity that's there. And even if we apply this uh, super resolution network that we, we trained previously, we see that we can at best restore the outlines, but really the, the fine grained details is missing. Um, and then kind of one of the other problems that we kind of discovered, which is still you know, uh, it's kind of funny is that it, resolving to a good solution is really problematic sometimes, given that you start from a, you know, a point where you have very little information. So in this case, our network couldn't decide which way the stripes went on the zebra and decided the best way to resolve it is just to give crisscross stripes. <laughs> um, and we often say like the zebra is like the, the mortal nemesis of the magic pony. <laughs> So um, let's kind of move on to more recent work, which is kind of the stuff I'm more in excited to present. Uh, we've been looking at, you know, how can we address this problem? Um, and one of the things that we thought about was actually the, the choice of loss function is not particularly well suited for, you know, high fidelity uh, or even to sort of reflect how we as humans uh, view images. Um, so there's some work that was published um, by the author, um, that came up with SSIM as a quality metric. So it's a different Zed Wang, not me. Um, and then basically one of the things they discovered is like, if you ask an audience, like, how do you rate this from, you know, a scale of like one to 10? And at the same time, you're measuring, measuring objectively using, you know, the, the classic metric that's used in industry, which is uh, peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR. You see there's actually quite a wide um, 
sort of level response from like what we as humans think is high quality versus what you know the machine says on a pixel level this is high quality so if we you know if you look at sort of psnr of like 30 the range of response for what is good or bad it can vary from like you know i give it a 3 out of 10 to like i give it 8 out of 10 um, and so this is kind of one of the ideas that we kind of used in this uh, new approach which is using uh, a gan network so this is um, something we will be presenting next month at CVPR. Um, and really, we try to come up with a way to evaluate the loss function of how do you restore that uh, image and how do you measure that difference. And, make and we came up with a perceptual loss. So this is a combination of using a content loss, which we use in the VGG network, to measure plus an adversarial loss from using this GAN training approach. Um, so just very quickly, what is a GAN? It's a generative adversarial network, which is kind of one of the hot topics right now in sort of machine learning research. Uh, and really, the, the idea that's kind of very interesting here, instead of, instead of training a single network to do one job, you actually have two networks which are opposing each other in slightly what they're trying to do. And so you have a generator and a discriminator. So the generator, essentially, our super resolution network, which is trying to generate you know, high quality images. At the same time, we have a discriminator, which is saying, does this look like it's high resolution? Does this look like it's high quality? Um, and basically, you kind of have this sort of opposing functions, which is helping it weight the sort of the training process and the, and the the overall loss function. So what this means is that you know, whereas before when we train and we just have a single you know network, which is just trying to minimize um, like the PSNR, uh, and when you give it like you know hundreds of examples, it's actually just taking sort of the average of all the possible you know. Uh, results that we've given it, um, which actually means you kind of just get an average of all the good solutions rather than one good solution. And what the GAN uh, sort of adversarial approach really does is pushes the result into sort of, if you can think of it as sort of like a manifold of natural images, it's pushing it into this manifold, which may not be the exact solution, but it means it is far more likely to be perceived as being correct than if we just take an average of all the possible solutions. Um, so just to give you some example of like how, how this would look, so um, left left side is like the you know the straw man everyone sets up as the bicubic upsampling, uh, and on the right we have the uh, original high resolution. If we apply, um, this is kind of an, a deeper version of the our initial uh, network, which is just doing trained the sort of usual single network way. We get something like this, which obviously is. An improvement, but however, it doesn't really match up to sort of the the high resolution. But then, if we apply the scan approach, this is where this, so the first time we saw this, we were actually you know, holy crap, this is actually doing something amazing. So, um, and this is kind of like well, like, yeah, I think we're actually onto something here. So, yeah, so you can see for yourself, like even though it doesn't, it's not exactly the same. At the same time, if you did not know what the high resolution image looked like, you would say, actually, this is a resolution I expect for that, you know, the level of fidelity I expect for that type of resolution. Um, and then just to give you some more examples, so here's that example with the snake again, um, applying, you know, you know, standard um, super resolution network, just, you know, does better job of what already exists in the low resolution, but doesn't reconstruct what might be in sort of the high resolution. And then when we use the scan approach, it's adding all of this extra detail, which may not be exactly you know, what it is in the high resolution. But at the same time, if we think from a perspective like what we're trying to achieve with video compression and in terms of video delivery, we're achieving that high fidelity um, sort of result. Um, so, so kind of one of the interesting questions about this is that you know, we've essentially taken on a completely new um, objective, uh, or it's not even wholly objective. Uh, sort of uh, quality measure for like what is you know good quality and what is not good quality and sort of the industry standard of using PSNR at this point is completely um, you know invalidated because of the fact we see like the third one from from the left this is a result of using the scan approach looks much much better and much closer to the original at the same time if you look at the PSNR it's worse than you know even the bicubic one which is like giving you no and additional sort of information in that domain. So this kind of really throws a question towards like, you know, the video compression industry and, you know, the quality me me measuring industry as a whole, like, you know, is PSNR even the right 
tool to be used here. Uh, and then when we did um, sort of human subject evaluations, uh, sort of using the mean opinion score, and we said, hey, here's a bunch of images, how do you rate them, you know, from, in this case, from scale of one to five, where five is like the best possible score, we see that using the scan approach is far closer to the original high resolution in terms of what, you know, as humans we think of quality compared to any sort of previous method that's come before. Um, and I guess one kind of question that remains is like, does it work on zebras? <laughs> uh, so this is with the ResNet. So this is actually a slightly harder problem than I showed in the original slide. So that one was like three times in each dimension of super resolution. This is four times, so it's going to sort of even bigger um, change in dimensionality. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite get there. Uh, it is obviously, you know, higher in fidelity, but the correctness of what we expect for a zebra is not quite there. Um, but like, as uh, one of my colleagues says, good news, that means there's still more to do. Deep learning doesn't just solve everything magically. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I'd like to sort of show a demo, so if we can play the clip. Um, so this is actually us testing out how we could work, work with it in, in the world with, you know, footage. Um, that we're you know streaming on Twitter, for instance, so for the NFL. So on the left-hand side, we have the um, uh, the uh, low-resolution image, which is you know pretty highly compressed. And then on the right-hand side is basically the output if we pass it through this SR GAN network. And you can see there's actually a huge difference in sort of the level quality that you have. So you know we're obviously making still continuing to make process in there, but this is a good sign that hopefully at some point we'll get this. Uh, into solve this and put it into production as well. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry, I haven't finished the, the talk. Got five more minutes. I was saying thanks to the audio video guys. Um, so, one final bit I wanted to talk to was actually this final view of compression as a whole and, and super resolution. Um, so, typically, you think of like you know data transmission for for videos. Uh, and we have an encoder on the server side. On the client side, you have a way to decode it, and you're sending data packets from server to client. Um, and effectively, what this super resolution is doing is it's a, it's a post processor. You are essentially lowering the uh, resolution. That can itself be thought of as a preprocessor. So by lowering the resolution and then encoding it, you've lowered the sort of amount of data you need to send. And on the other end, you can super resolve it and then try and recover as high quality as you can out of it. Um, in effect, it's sort of achieving compression, but it's kind of actually really the first step. So, you know, the, another way to look at this is actually, you could think of this as a whole, as a completely end-to-end -end problem that you can try and optimize using machine learning. Um, and this is kind of one, one of the pieces that we've been, we've also been doing. Um, one of the caveats here is that, you know, quantization, sort of the, the act of throwing data away, itself is not a differentiable process, so it's quite hard to train a network to, to solve this. Um, but that's actually kind of one of the things that one of our, our guys, Lucas, has done. So he's basically come up with this network, which can be split into sort of like the encoder and decoder. You train it entirely uh, end to end. And to solve this um, quantize, sort of quantization problem, he's come up with a way to essentially model um, that lossy component, which you can't differentiate, but the probabilistic model that we use to to approximate it can be differentiated. Um, at the same time, we can sort of adjust the model to control for like the number of bits versus sort of the amount of distortion that we want to preserve or limit it to. Um, and just like very quickly in sort of the last few couple of minutes, so these are some of the results that we achieved in sort of this approach, and this is really the approach that we think, you know, for the video industry, this is the future rather than these hand-tuned um, sort of algorithms that you know takes decades for a massive amounts of teams to, to develop we can look at using the machine learning to completely optimize that and uh, change that <clears throat> and so um, this sort of is kind of I guess more like preliminary results we've we've shown on um, on images so CAE on on the left is a, a approach that we come up with uh, the compressive autoencoder and it, we can see that it's outperforms kind of JPEG and JPEG 2000. And on the right was uh, a method um, released just like a couple of months before us uh, from a team in Google. Um, <laughs> not saying anything here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we see like a whole variety of sort of uh, bit rates. We can sort of show better quality. 
Uh, and then when we sort of evaluate sort of along sort of existing metrics, uh, like PSNR, SSIM, we are competitive or get outperforming JPEG 2000 here. Um, and then even when we evaluate it sort of with human subjective testing, we show that actually humans would prefer sort of the approach that's, that's bar in black, uh, even over sort of JPEG 2000, which is one in yellow. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of like first steps, but hopefully like, you know, there's a lot of other teams also thinking on these lines and it'll be kind of a very interesting field sort of going forward into the future. Uh, and now I am done. <laughs> uh, Take some questions. Just one over here. Hey, I'm Richard uh, from Columbia University. Um, when you transition from uh, applying uh, to from uh, pictures to video, do you do just um, do you apply it just naively to each frame, or do you do something a bit more clever with the? Um, so we've we actually got two approaches where we I mean initially we started just naively with a single frame, but um, actually one of the another one of the papers we're presenting at the year CVPR is actually looking at multi-frame sort of coming into the network and coming out with a single frame out the other end. And we kind of explore a whole bunch of different um, neural networks in terms of the architectures to try and exploit this temporal information as well. So we show that, yes, if you take in more frames, you get better results, which kind of is expected. Hi, uh, Peter from Facebook. Um, could you share how Twitter is already using uh, your research right now? <laughs> uh, unfortunately not, <laughs> so no, uh, I mean, so part of, um, I guess, since our acquisition, we've been sort of integrating it into uh, the product itself. Um, some of it we've been trialing in the world, but nothing is, you know, officially public yet, and we haven't, you know, really officially launched anything yet on this front. So. Uh, Jonathan Sang from Fidelity. A random question, how, how, how asymmetric is the processing load at both ends of the code to decoder? Where um, are you? Uh, how asymmetric <laughs> is the processing load at both ends of the coder decoder? I guess if you're decoding on a smartphone, that's going to be chewing up battery if you're not careful. Just curious. Um, yeah, so uh, sort of in the super resolution approach, obviously we only care about the decoder, the encoder just using standard uh, video uh, codecs. Um, and that side, you know, we, we can really tune the model to be performant depending on what device you want to put it on. So the size of the neural network itself can be altered. Um, and a whole bunch of other parameters in terms of how we sort of optimize it. Uh, Trian, the founder of gaming company Quizdom. One question, would it make sense to have a parallel neural network which understands that this is an NFL game with 20 players and so have, have two lines there and then they, they support each other? If you understood. Um, yeah, I mean, I, one of the sort of possible extension points for this is to bring in um, really semantic information, more high-level inf information for the neural for the network itself. So, in terms of both the compression network and um, the super-resolution network, it's really low-level uh, visual processing. So, it has no, you know, not explicitly anyway, any context of like what is this within this image. It knows how certain sort of patterns in images are represented and how they change from sort of low resolution to high resolution. But yeah, one of the you know, possible extensions to look at how do you combine semantic information or if you, you, know, you just use it as sort of like a pre-processor to, to branch between different networks, so yeah. If we don't do this at the moment, might in the future. Um, so I guess we kind of have something that we're exploring along these lines, but it's not currently sort of within one single network. We'll just take one last question here on the left. Hi. Um, have you considered, instead of working straight from the RGB or YUV output of the, the video decoder, stripping a few more levels off and working from some earlier stage of H.264 or whatever it is you're using? Right, yeah. That's um, one of the things that we kind of actually thought about uh, very early on. But from sort of practical standpoint, it's very 
difficult to get to that sort of layers on a practical basis. So um, for most mobile phones, you have hardware decoders which do all this processing. So actually to sort of interrupt that and get into that low level is actually incredibly difficult. So from a practical point, there's not actually you know, <laughs> much way to, leeway there, unfortunately. All right, great. Thank you so much, Zian. Thanks.